Greetings, this is Greg. In the European theater during World War II, there were a number of Allied four-engine bombers. Among those, we have the Avro Lancaster, the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress, and Consolidated's B-24 Liberator. Now, there were others, like the Handley Page Halifax, but for this video, I'm sticking with the three most well-known heavies. Of these three airplanes, which was the fastest? This question is more complicated than it sounds at first. Fastest at what altitude? It's possible that one plane could be the fastest at high altitude, but the slowest down low. Are we going to look at absolute maximum speeds at a power setting that was limited to five minutes, or at maximum sustainable power for a sustained cruise speed? Furthermore, there are many variations of each airplane. Should I use the absolute fastest version, even if it was built in limited numbers or never even dropped a bomb? What about weight? That has an effect here. A B-24 isn't going to be as fast at 55,000 pounds as it will be at 35,000 pounds. Although that actually has less of an effect on top speed than you might think, it's still a factor because we've got, got to get data for all of these airplanes at the same weight. Then we have the problem of missing data. For some airplanes, like the B-24, just about any data point you could want can be found in the pilot's manual. That's nice, but it's less true for the B-17, and it's not even close to true for the Lancaster. So I'm going to piece all of this together as best I can, and I'll walk you through the data and show you the results. Let's start with the B-24 Liberator. Of these three, I think the B-24 is the most underrepresented in almost every area. Movies, documentaries, books, video games, and so on. It was built in greater numbers than either of the other two. There were more than twice as many B-24s built as there were Lancasters. And the B-24, in no small way, shared responsibility for the Allied victory in Europe. In terms of speed, the B-24 has a couple things going for it. That Davis wing, which was an early attempt at building a wing of laminar flow design, it's certainly not a true laminar flow wing, but it was relatively advanced for its time. The plane is powered by four Pratt & Whitney R1830s. The R1830 is a twin-row 14-cylinder air-cooled radial. It's the same basic engine that's used in many versions of the Grumman Wildcat, the PBY Catalina, and a lot of other airplanes. It's a strong, reliable engine, putting out about 1,200 horsepower. What's special in this case is that in this application, it's boosted by an intercooled turbocharging system blowing into a mechanically driven supercharger. This enables it to make that 1,200 horsepower up to some very high altitudes, and without the supercharger gap a lot of gear-driven types suffered from. For more on this, please watch this video. I'll put the link in the description. The B-24 manual I'm using for this has performance data for various mid to late war variants. Here's the cruise performance chart. Initially, it's a bit confusing to look at it, but it's ideal for what we're doing because it has all the data we need, and I wish this sort of chart was available for all World War II airplanes. Of course, it just isn't. I'll walk you through the chart so you can see how it works. It's actually pretty cool, and this is the chart that the pilots and flight engineer would have been using during the war. On the left-hand side of the chart, we have density altitude in thousands of feet, and on the right side, density altitude in just plain feet. Obviously, these two are functionally the same thing. It's, they just put it on both sides of the chart for clarity. Here, I've drawn blue lines through the areas of the chart we won't be needing today. The section where I drew the blue X is for adjusting pressure altitude for temperature and coming up with density altitude. But for our purposes today, we're assuming a standard day, so we don't need to use this correction. The line at the top is through the indicated airspeed numbers. We don't need those for this exercise because we're comparing true airspeed for the three airplanes. It doesn't really matter in comparative terms what the pilot's airspeed indicator is reading. What matters is how fast the plane is moving through the air, which, of course, is by definition true airspeed. So that brings us to true airspeed. This is represented by very lightly shaded lines that run at an angle down and to the right. I highlighted the 260 mile per hour line and circled the 260 to 330 mile per hour numbers. The lower speeds can be found along the line near the base of the chart going from 250 down to 140 miles per hour. So let's run a sample problem. How fast can a B-24 go at a density altitude of 30,000 feet and a weight of 60,000 pounds? 
Most B-24s had maximum takeoff weights, well, most of the early ones, of 66,000 pounds. Later versions could go to 70,000 pounds. So in either case, a cruise weight of 60,000 pounds would be really heavy, but possible. We're also going to assume that the plane had upgraded B-22 turbos, which became standard on this plane during the war. I want to stress that I'm using common versions of all the planes that were used as bombers, not stripped down special versions like the Liberator Express shown here. We start by drawing a line from our density altitudes of 30,000 feet over to our maximum power line, which gives us power setting of 48.5 inches of manifold pressure at 2700 RPM. This power setting has a five minute limitation. We'll get to the sustained speeds for sustained power settings later. Note the dashed line just below where our altitude and power line intersect. That's the limit for this airplane if its engines are equipped with the earlier B2 turbos, so this doesn't apply to us. We can look at the true airspeed line and it shows about 322 miles per hour, pretty darn fast. However, this chart is based on a weight of 35,000 pounds and we're a lot heavier than that, so we have to correct for our weight. Now we go straight down to our weight of 60,000 pounds. From there, follow the contour back up to the 35,000 pound baseline, then straight back up to our 30,000 foot density altitude. Let's zoom in on that and read the true airspeed. We see that we have about 298 miles per hour. So that's our maximum true airspeed in level flight at 30,000 feet and at 60,000 pounds. Now do that for every altitude from sea level to 30,000 feet in 5,000 foot increments to get numbers. Now let's put all that onto a line graph to make it easier to read and we have this. Now there's a little room for error here. First of all I did this in 5,000 foot increments but also my Microsoft Paint skills aren't perfect so when drawing those lines and getting the numbers there are going to be very small errors but this is darn close probably within a couple miles per hour at any given altitude. At this point we should graph the speeds for maximum continuous power as that's really what counts. Speed with a five minute limitation is great for catching up if you dropped out of formation for some reason or if alone it could help you get away from danger quickly you're not going to outrun a German fighter but if it's low on fuel you might outdistance it or allow enough time for your escorts to help out more on outrunning fighters later. On the cruise chart, it shows that we can run 46 inches of manifold pressure and 2550 RPM for one hour. However, with 100 octane fuel, which is what I'm using for all three airplanes, we can run that continuously in the B-24, provided, of course, temperatures stay within limits, as with any power setting. Here are the charted numbers. As you can see, speed drops at 30,000 feet from 298 miles per hour to 283 miles per hour a 15 mile per hour difference. At lower altitudes, the speeds are closer and generally the difference between these two power settings is about 10 miles per hour. Of course, we need something to compare this to, so let's bring in the Avro Lancaster. This is the only plane that brought the more streamlined, liquid-cooled V12s to this party. Now, there were some Lancasters with air-cooled radial engines, but for this comparison, I wanted to stick with the more common and iconic type which run Rolls-Royce Merlin V12s. There are many variants within the Lancaster lineup, and for this comparison, I settled on the Lancaster 3. These typically have a maximum takeoff weight of 65,000 pounds, so they will easily meet our cruise objective of 60,000 pounds. They have injection carburetors equivalent to those on the B-17 and B-24, and were a common variant. They are also identical in performance to the Lancaster 10, which was essentially a Canadian-built Lancaster 3. What I didn't want here was an earlier variant with the ventral turret slowing it down, or an old-style carburetor, or some version that was built in insignificant numbers or some other oddball configuration. So I'm using the Lancaster 3 with Merlin 38s. These had single-stage, two-speed superchargers, as did the vast majority of Lancasters. So this setup is very representative of a typical mid to late war Lancaster. There was one type of Lancaster packing two-stage, two-speed supercharged Merlins. Two-stage. However, there were only nine examples built, of which two were kept by Rolls-Royce as test beds. Of the remaining seven, 
They flew a small number of missions as pathfinders, mostly as pathfinders anyway, before being pulled from service for lack of reliability. Thus, they don't fit into a comparison of general use heavy bombers, but I'll put the speeds up for it at the end of the video in case you're curious about it. It was pretty impressive. Sadly, there isn't a lot of data out there about Lancaster performance, at least not as compared to the B-17 or B-24. There is essentially nothing useful in the pilot's manual. The best graph we have is from this document, which also discusses that two-stage variant, and it has a speed graph for the Lancaster 3 at 60,000 pounds, exactly what we need. It's quite a good document, and of course it can be found in the Patreon section. Details of this are in the description. I did cross-check it with other graphs, and it's in harmony with what little other information is out there, especially when you factor in the weight, as almost all Lancaster speed tests were done at much lower weights. So let's graph the Lancaster. Again, it's at 60,000 pounds and with the Merlin 38s. I'll use red for its speed at maximum power, which like the B-24 is limited to five minutes, so pretty much apples to apples. As you can see, the Lancaster easily outruns the B-24 at low altitudes, but it really starts to lose steam above 18,000 feet, and it's really out of breath above 21,000. At that point, the B-24 is still gaining speed as it goes higher and higher, all the way up to 30,000 feet and beyond. Now, let's add in the numbers for the Lancaster's maximum cruise speed. I'll use pink here. It's clear that below 20,000 feet, the Lancaster has a decent edge in maximum speed and in maximum sustainable cruise speed. Above 20,000 feet, at least much above that, it's all B-24. Ultimately, the B-24 is faster, but it's the B-24's altitude capability that probably matters more in terms of protection from anti-aircraft fire. According to the U.S. Army Air Force, a good rule of thumb is that every 5,000 feet of altitude decreases your chances of a flak hit by half. So there's a pretty big difference between 20,000 feet and 25,000 feet. This diagram helps to explain that the lower you are, the more stuff there is that can reach you. Now, let's add in a B-17G. The B-17 is a big airplane, bigger than it looks in pictures. I think it tends to look smaller in pictures because of its somewhat sleek looking fuselage. But its wingspan is greater than a Lancaster's, and its fuselage length is the longest of these three airplanes. In the case of the G model, it's dragging a chin turret, plus, of course, like all combat B-17s, or at least most of them used in the war, it has that underside ball turret it's got to drag through the air, and that certainly doesn't help with parasite drag. It does, however, have some things going for it. It was powered by Wright Cyclone R1820s. These single row radials are quite powerful for their weight, and they're force fed by an intercooled turbo supercharging system very similar to what was on uh, the B24. Now, on paper, it sort of looks like the B17 is a serious underdog here. It has the smallest engine of the group, roughly 1,820 cubic inches, versus 1,830 for the B24 and 1,650 for the Lancaster. It has the fewest cylinders with 9 per engine versus 14 for the B-24 and 12 for the Lancaster. And it's also the oldest design here. The B-17 first flew in 1935, the B-24 in 1939, and the Lancaster in 1941. For comparison, the B-29 first flew in late 1942, so by World War II bomber standards, the B-17 was quite long in the tooth, especially as compared with the Lancaster. Yet, we don't want to count it out. Boeing knew what they were doing, and its performance is a little better than you might initially think. Strangely, the G model pilot manual doesn't have cruise, doesn't have cruise charts for the G model. It has cruise charts for the F model, and that's a bit different. The big difference is the lack of a chin turret on the F model. The G model cruise charts are not in any B-17 manual I have. There must have been a supplement that the USAAF put out, but I cannot find it. Now, there are wartime U.S. Army Air Force tests of the G model, but they were done at slightly lower weight, so I'll have to use those and correct them for the extra weight, which is pretty easy to do. In other words, we're going to end up with numbers from 2 to 8 miles per hour lower than the official charts to simulate the higher weight. I'll add the B-17G's maximum speeds here in dark blue. It's the slowest down low where parasite drag is a big deal. 
As it climbs, it catches up to the B-24 at around 10,000 feet and catches up to the Lancaster at about 20,000. Up above 25,000, we don't have any data for a wartime B-17G. I found data for a B-17G from like the late 1940s. So I had to give you my best guess on the numbers much above 25,000, just based on other B-17 data. We know the engines on this airplane run out of breath around 27,000, at which point power starts to really drop off with altitude. Up at that altitude, 27 and above, the B-24's B-22 turbo upgrade really shines. Now let's add in the maximum cruise power. I'm using 41.5 inches of manifold pressure. Now an argument could be made that I should have used 38 inches, but 41.5 was available as a maximum continuous setting, so that's what I'm using. So this chart shows the full story, at least in respect to maximum speeds at very high weights. When below 15,000 feet, the Lancaster is always the fastest. It doesn't matter if you're looking at combat power or max cruise. It's still the fastest down there. At sea level, it's about 25 miles an hour faster than a B-17G and about 15 miles an hour faster than a B-24. At 20,000 feet, things start to change. At max power, the Lancaster is still going strong. It's right there with the B-17 and still about 8 miles per hour ahead of the B-24. However, that's only good for 5 minutes. At maximum sustained power, the Lancaster falls behind both airplanes at 20,000 feet. At 25,000 feet, the Lancaster isn't even in the contest. And the B-17 is about 7 miles an hour faster than the B-24. Once we get above 26,000, much more than that, the Liberator with its B-22 turbos leaves everyone else behind and has the fastest speed on this chart at about 298 miles per hour at 30,000 feet. So which is the fastest? Well, ultimately it's the Liberator, but the realities of usage mean it would depend on the altitude. So in a sense, they're all the fastest. None of these planes are going to outrun a BF-109. However, the altitude capability of the U.S. bombers does make them more difficult to intercept. This was especially true against Japanese fighters, which really struggled to reach B-17s or B-24s at high altitude. They could easily catch the U.S. bomber or any other bombers down at 15,000 feet. But at 25,000 feet, it's another matter. And at 30,000 feet, the B-24 was nearly untouchable by most Japanese fighters. Now just for fun, I'm going to put up the Lancaster 6 with the dual stage Merlin 85s. Again, only 7 of these went into service, not 70, 7. And again, they were pulled out of service for lack of reliability, but it's fun to look at it while we're here. The purple line is for the plane at maximum cruise power. As you can see, the dual stage supercharging system put the Lancaster right there at 25,000 feet with the U.S. bombers. Now here is the orange line at combat power with a five minute limitation. It also has some real altitude limitations because it runs out of breath pretty early when it's uh, putting out that much power. It doesn't, the line doesn't really fit on my chart, but that's the best I could do. Again, the actual charts are coming up and the original documents containing that chart uh, can be found in its entirety in the Patreon section. On that subject, I want to thank my Patreon supporters. Without them, these videos wouldn't happen. That's all for now. Goodbye and have a great day.